Welcome to another episode of the Poetic Wax Show. I'm your host, Black Wax, and I got my co-host, Zeus. What's going on, bro? Hey, how's it going, everybody? What's good, Wax? Everything is great. You know, you came up with this great tagline, and so I want you to use it like every show. Uh, do you remember what it is? No, no. Uh, tell me. Two common guys with exquisite taste. Fantastic. I'll, I'll put it into use every time we, we get together. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we uh, got together. Um, I know that you had a great holiday. You were off for work for like a week and a half. I was off work for a week and a half, and that was a great time to like unwind, to recharge our batteries, to refocus, and to, you know, watch a lot of cat videos. Um, But I'm always interested what people do on New Year's Eve. How was your New Year's Eve? New Year's Eve was good. I spent it with my girlfriend's family. Mm -hmm. We hung out, ate some good food, played some music, had some adult beverages, and just kind of hung out and enjoyed each other's company. It was it was real nice. Cool. No uh, crazy New Year's traditions, you know. Right. We counted down uh, at 11.59 and 50 seconds. We started counting down to, to midnight. And I laid a big smoochy wet kiss on my girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. Had a good time. Yeah. How about yourself? Do you have any traditions? I know some people eat certain things or do certain things. Do you have any of those with your family? Uh, growing up, uh, my family always got together on New Year's Day, and we had you know black eyed peas. That was the you know good luck food and cabbage. You know maybe a little bit more turkey and dressing. But uh, that's what we did traditionally growing up. Um, and even in my adult life, you know, I still eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day. Um, I missed it this year. Um, but I, a tradition that my wife and I have, we like to do something just a little bit different every New Year's Eve. And uh, she kind of beat me to the, to the punch this year in making the plans and arrangements. But she did a really good job. Uh, we went to this restaurant on New Year's Eve. Uh, it was uh, my wife and my mother-in-law. And uh, it was called the Louisiana Street Grill. And uh, it's a Cajun seafood restaurant just a little bit east of downtown McKinney, Texas. And, you know, they had this three-course meal, uh, live band, and a champagne toast. And, you know, we've been there a couple times before, and it was a real nice atmosphere. Wasn't a lot of people there. But it was, you know, just laid back and just chill. And, you know, we, we, uh, we, we had a good time because, you know, a lot of times uh, when we go out for New Year's, we either have, like, you know, somewhere to sit but nothing to eat or something to eat but nowhere to sit. <laughs> so, you know, we, we were able to get all, everything that we wanted in one place um, this New Year's Eve. And so... We didn't. We didn't make it to midnight. We left probably about eleven fifteen or so. We were home by midnight, and so um, you know it was just real low key, laid back. Um, I like person. I like to turn up as much as I can on New Year's Eve. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like, man, we made it. We survived <laughs> another year. We need to celebrate. And um, um, actually, as funny as this may sound, on New Year's Eve during the day, we took the kids to the casino. Um, oh, that's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we went to uh, Choctaw, and Choctaw, they have expanded, and uh, they're renovating. And they and, and in the back, towards the south, southern part of the casino, they have a movie theater, they have restaurants, and they have, like, you know, lots of kids' games. And so we bought some gift cards, uh, some game cards for the kids, and you know, we got a $20 gift card, and they, you know, they gave us free uh, like a free five dollar bonus, and so my daughter, she, you know, she was having a great time, and she ended up having, you know, some money left on her account. My son, you know, his games was just a little bit too cheap. He got on these motorcycle games, and he pressed that nitrogen uh, button, and just he was just having a blast. 
And I'm like, we're not going to be able to finish his gift card anytime soon. So we left like with $17 on his card. But they both won prizes and had a great time. And, you know, as funny as it sounds, you know, my kids, just, they, they had a great time at the casino. And we didn't, we didn't gamble much. Well, actually, we didn't gamble at all. Um, uh, but we had a great time. You know, it's just like a 45-minute drive from where we live. And so, um, I don't know. It's, it's a cool spot that we that we go. Sometimes we go just to listen to live music or, you know, just to hang out. So we don't even gamble most of the time when we go to the casino. But um, it, it was nice. It was nice. You know, I've never been a ginormous gambler. Right. By any stretch of the word. Right. And I've never been to a casino in the sense of, like, pleasure. Like, I've always gone for work purposes. And okay. on January 1st, my girlfriend and I, we drove up to Windstar. Okay. Because I had purchased, I had purchased a couple scratchers from 7-Eleven, I think, with okay. my daughter. And I had won a little bit of money. And I've always enjoyed scratchers. They're, you know, they're just kind of fun. And so I laid down... I don't know, like 30 or 40 bucks on some scratchers. I ended up coming out of there with about 100 bucks. Wow. And on top of my 40, so I walked away with my, my 40 I invested plus 100 bucks. And so I told my girlfriend, said, you know, I've never been to a casino. Uh, I got this $100 that I won from scratchers plus $100 that I kind of just had on the side. So I, let me just take this 200 bucks and see what I could do. I spoke with some people who said that they've gone before and they took 200 bucks and they came back with, you know, five or seven. So I was hopeful, right? Right. So I jumped in the car and that place, when we got there, was packed. Oh, man. yeah. It was, it was insane how packed that place was. And so I ended up sitting, it was hard to get a seat, first of all. And the machines that struck me as interesting were busy and had at least one or two people standing behind the current person playing the machine. So we ended up spending know, about 60 bucks on on slot machines trying to make something happen. And nothing happened. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and keep this other 140 I had kind of put aside. And uh, let's just go ahead and head home because I didn't want to lose the rest of that money. <laughs> I did. So, uh, next time you guys go to Choctaw, maybe we can join you. Let me know. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna plan that this year uh, because it's, it's a fun thing to do. Definitely, I feel like it's fun with couples as well. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely gonna plan it, and um, I'll, I'll give you plenty of advance notice. So, uh, good. yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, um, one of the, another reason why I like going to the casino. It's just one of the few places where you can smoke your pipe or your cigar indoors. Oh, fantastic. Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't know that at first until I got there. And there was, it was just a cloud of smoke in there. Yeah. 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 It wasn't too smoky in um, in Choctaw. Uh, so I smoked a little bit of my cigar. But it was one of the cigars that my wife brought me back from Belize. And it was pretty, pretty stout. So... Um, I couldn't really finish it. So, um, speaking of cigars, how was that uh, Casino Gold? Did you get an opportunity to uh, check that one out? Uh, yes. And I thought it was extremely smooth. Yes. I really enjoyed it. I didn't... I mean, you and I have gone back and forth, and we've... When we go to the uh, Infuego yeah. or any of the other... Cigar lounge areas that we frequent, we're always, you know, eager to try something new. And to find something as reasonably priced as the Casino Gold that you uh, gave me for Christmas, yeah. man, it was smooth. I agree. Real smooth. Yeah, that that that's on my list. I'm a, I'm gonna reorder that one. Yeah, you should. And if there's some kind of a price break or a discount, let me know. I'll put in on I'm getting a few with you. Okay. We definitely can make that happen. Um, did you did you ever get your order in from um, Cigar International? I did. I'm waiting for it to arrive. Oh, okay. Okay. Very good. Um, so if we get it, we can do a, an unboxing. 
Very good. I look forward to that. I definitely look forward to that. So, um, I'm drinking this um, this rum inspired drink that I got from uh, Aldi. And um, Aldi sells liquor. They don't sell liquor. They, they call it a wine, but it, we 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 use it as a rum when we make pina coladas around here. And I didn't have anything to drink tonight, so I was like, let me pour just a little bit of this for my dinner. But um, I'll have to I'll have to uh, let you try it and see what you think about it. It's I've been drink we've been drinking it for years, and it's seasonal, so we don't always you know get it year round. But luckily, there's an Aldi like right down the street from uh, from my house. And so, um, you know, I, I can get it fairly easily when it's in stock. So, uh, what, what? That's fantastic, yeah. Yes, you have sir? to let me, uh, sample that. The other liquor that you had, the liquor that you had given me along with the cigar was, yes. was rather tasty, too. Yes, yes. That's, um, that, that, that's actually new to me, that, that Canadian Mist. Um, it, it's new to me, so... Uh, and it was it wasn't very expensive, so it's definitely on my list to uh, repurchase as well. And where can where can we find that Canadian mist? Like, where can our listeners find it? Um, I found it at uh, Fossil Creek, but I'm pretty sure they sell it at like uh, you know your mo- your like your Total Wine or your Specs. I'm pretty sure most of them do carry that Canadian mist. Um, there's a new liquor store right down the street from uh where we were uh last time we met in Louisville is called Apple Jacks or something like that. Have you seen that spot in Louisville? No, I haven't. Yeah, it's right there on um uh 121 um uh past that 7-Eleven not too far from I can't think of the name of the cross street, but uh they have a big sign that says cigars. And they have like a real small, little tiny humidor. It's nothing really extravagant. But they just open. And so I'm going to give them a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months to stock their humidor and see if they uh, carry anything worthwhile there. So, yeah, you should check it out. Next time you're in that Louisville area, right on the service road, you'll see that big Apple Jacks. Um, I think it's next to like a, a like a storage facility. And um, I, I, I had to look up. Maybe I can look it up right now. I have to check that out. It's surprising how many liquor stores have been opening up in the Louisville area ever since they were sanctioned for it. But I think Total Wine has really cornered the market. Everyone that I know in that area goes there because of the selection and the pricing. I am a huge fan of Total Wine. I mean, the selection, the pricing, the ambiance. I've never like been to a class at Total Wine, but every time I go, I was like, "Man, I gotta sign up. I gotta. I'm on the mailing list, but I gotta attend one of their events." We should. We should attend one and see if they'll let us report during the event. Yeah, that would be cool. Schedule some time afterwards and let everybody know what we thought. I'll I'll get us some tickets to to one of the events. Maybe for a bourbon or, or a scotch event. Oh, that'd be great. You know, the first... The fir- That's something that, I, that I'd really like to learn more about. Yeah. Yeah, I went to this uh, single malt scotch event uh, at a Specs um, uptown, or actually North Dallas area, uh, with a buddy of mine, Willie. And um, I still got the, uh, the magazine they gave me from that. And, uh, man, it was very, very informative. Um, we tried three different, um, three different whiskeys. Uh, one was like aged for 18, one was aged for 16 years, and one was cased in uh, cherry. And you know they were all pretty potent. But you know, getting some background and, and learning more about how you know scotch is made is very, very fascinating to me. It's very fascinating. Yeah, so it's always so interesting. I've never learned about it, so I'm going to go ahead and, and sign this up for a class. I'll give you the information as soon as I get the the tickets purchased. Sounds great. So, you know, the last time that we met, uh, we were having a little bit of knife talk, and I pulled out my blade, you pulled out your blade, and, uh, of course, your, 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 your knife trumped mine, but 
you know, I expect that you you're, you're definitely more of a um, of a uh, weapons and nice knife guy than I am. But I don't know, man. I I caught the bug like instantly. Like um, I've been on YouTube every other day watching EDC knife videos, and I'm just blown away. Uh, there's yeah, a. <laughs> um, it's a a little bit of a connoisseur of of knives, I guess. I not so much of a snob because I can appreciate all blades. Right. But I truly, truly enjoy and, and feel that. I mean, if, if you find yourself with a need of one, uh, you should carry one. I think I think you should carry one always, regardless if you if you have a need because a need can certainly always arise. I mean, you don't always have to carry. Crocodiles on these size knives. Right. You know, it doesn't have to be the size of your arm, but a you know a small. But for for a point of reference, Victorinox, which is more commonly known by folks as the, the Swiss Army knife. Okay. A uh, Victorinox makes a, a fantastic little pocket tool, and it's called the Cadet. Okay. My favorite of the Victorinoxes, and it has. Uh, a few little handy tools in it, a, a can opener, a bottle opener, a nail file, and those that I just mentioned, the can opener the and the nail file, both have like a flat kind of tip at the end that's two different sizes and it's really good for like a flathead, screwdriver-esque kind of tool. You can use the nail file to probe and it also comes with a really nice blade um, they tend to be more prone to rust because they're not a high quality steel however they keep a really good edge they cut really nice and I usually you'll usually find me carrying one or having one in a bag that I have carrying with me and I use them regularly to you know cut into an apple or slice up you know some kind of a fruit and they're just always handy to have. That's interesting. You know, you and I both work in a corporate environment, and I've heard you say this a couple of times that you always carry. Um, is there any is there any feedback negative that you've gotten, or anybody raising an eyebrow, or have anything to say about you pulling out a knife when you want to, you know, Man. eat an apple at work? Let me tell you. So, so. At first, I was definitely very, uh, what's the word I want to use, uh, not concerned with people's opinion. I thought to myself, I'm going to do what I think is best, and if people don't like it, well, that's tough for them, right? Which is not, I mean, not the greatest approach to have, right? Especially when it comes in the society that we live in, certainly you should do what you feel is best for yourself. However, you got to take into consideration other people's emotions and feelings for a little bit of it, right? Right. And so I carried with me my first, my first, my first carry knife that I carried with me regularly was the Kershaw Blur. And that blade is about three and a half inches long. Um, and it's definitely an aggressive more aggressive, I should say, looking knife than the than some of the smaller blades because of the length of it. And it's a Tonto blade, which has a a military look to it. Definitely a piercing style of blade. The way the blade shape is, it was partially serrated, so and it was black handled and like a stone wash blade. So it, it was very. To someone who isn't a knife person, you know, um, when I open the knife, because it, it's assisted opening, so it's, it's spring-loaded, so I, I flick it, and the, the spring on the inside kind of does everything else for me. It opens up pretty quickly. That's why they call it the blur. Um, when I first pulled that out to assist into cutting open the traveling boxes that they give us when we move from building to building, they were sealed with zip ties. So to cut 
into the zip ties, I, I, you know, pulled out the knife and I started cutting into it. And one of the ladies that I work with kind of took a step back and she said, uh, why are you, why do you have a knife? And I, I told her, if I didn't have a knife, who would open up these boxes? <laughs> right? And, okay, yeah, right? If I, because everybody was like, who has scissors, who has something? And everybody, everybody had the same response. Oh, it's mine's in the box. <laughs> and someone got a, a an ink pen and wedged it between a zip tie and the container. I keep saying box, but they're like orange durable containers. You've seen them before. Yeah, the orange rent rent crates. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so someone wedged an ink pen in between there, and when they cranked on it to try to snap the zip tie, it broke the ink pen. So. If I wouldn't have had the knife, we would have had to find a different way to to open up those zip ties so that we could all get into our crates and be productive for the day. Right. That being said, so I have I have two different categories of of blades that I keep with me. One is for more of a tactical defensive use, and those those blades are a little bit longer. I usually start considering a blade for tactical application and self-defense applications at about three and a half to three and two quarters length, right? And all the way up to as, you know, as large as you want to carry it. And then for more of an EDC, you know, an everyday carry, which would, to me, and everybody has their own definition, right? But for me, my application or, or the needs that I use that knife for are going to be more for, you know, slicing into my lemons for my water, cutting up my cucumber, slicing into apple, or cutting into, you know, boxes that come into the office, you know, light, you know, utilitarian uses versus pulling out a blade that looks a little bit more menacing. And they should, in my opinion, if you have a tactical blade, I want to, if I have to pull out my blade, I want it to be menacing to the person that's on the other end of the receiving portion of that blade so that in hopes that they'll say, you know what, that blade looks as serious as this guy. Let me leave him alone, you know? And that's definitely not the look I want from my neighbor in the cubicle next to me, but I'm going to get to my apple, you know? Uh, So I use a smaller blade. For, for those applications. So I, I always have two knives on me. Well, uh, you pretty much uh, answered my next question, uh, which was, do you see a knife more of a tool or, or a weapon? And so now sounds like you see them uh, as both. I do see them as both. I mean, for you, you need the right tool for the job, and I think you can turn any tool into a weapon should you need it. Right. However, I think you should have a specific tool for the specific job, right? I mean, if you try to pry into or, or use a coin to unscrew something, it's going to be a lot more challenging than if you had a, a screwdriver, right? No doubt. So, if you... If that, that's just kind of the approach I take. You know? But everybody's use or philosophy of use is a term that I picked up from a YouTuber that I really enjoy watching his reviews and his name is Nut and Fancy N-U-T-N-F-A-N-C-Y Okay. and his reviews are really in-depth and they're funny to listen to because he just kind of tells it how it is and he gives real world thoughts and application he was uh, ex-military I think Air Force if I'm not mistaken he was an ex LEO, uh, law enforcement officer, and definitely an enthusiast in the backpacking and camping world. And so he really puts knives through their paces, beats on them, and puts use on them that is not inside the manufacturer's warranty to really give you an idea of how well built or how ill built these knives are. Wow, so. Um I'm going to have to check out some of his uh, videos. 
Um, I've been watching some videos on some uh, some knives, pocket knives here lately. I'm I'm more so into pocket knives right now. So that's pretty much what I've been uh, watching and um, just learning because there's a, a lot of guys they have a lot more uh, knowledge than than I do. So I'm just you know soaking up the knowledge. Um, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with uh, this brand called uh, Zero Tolerance, right? Zero Tolerance is a very nice, high-end knife. Those those blades are are pricey. I don't own one. They're they're outside of the range that I am able to spend on a knife and feel comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I found this one I really like. It was a Zero Tolerance zero four five six, and uh, it has. Like this, uh, it was it was silver and had like a like a turquoise um, circular insignia on it or something like that. And man, this guy he pulled it out. I was like, whoa, that is so serious. But it was it just like it 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 just it got my attention. And I did some research on it, and that is definitely a pricey knife. Whoa. Yeah, they they can be they can be a tad pricey, but now I'm. I have a few knives that are in the the higher end spectrum, but it really comes down to the quality, right? Okay. There, in my opinion, it's not for me to think of something as too expensive to spend money on means that I don't believe that the value is there for well, someone else might, right? Right. And. When I'm looking at zero tolerance knives, I compare them against a another well known brand is Benchmade. Right. I'll compare them against Benchmade or a Kershaw, which is definitely inside the reasonable price range, or a SOG, which is definitely inside a reasonable price range. And I look at the difference and I I think to myself, I could probably purchase two well one bench made and have some money in my pocket or two or three Kershaws or two or three Sogs for the price of one zero tolerance and I could walk away with three really great quality knives that can do all of the function that that one zero tolerance can you know so I'm I'm just not there where I'm able to to justify that price of a knife when I can find something comparable that I like almost as much or even more in some cases and for a, a lesser price. Yeah, so how do you feel about um, used knives? Maybe something you can find like on Amazon or Craigslist or at an antique store? Oh, certainly. I bought... I have a SOG Flash. No, I'm sorry. A SOG Zoom is the name of the knife. Z-O-O-M. And I purchased that on eBay from someone who had it. And they took pretty good care of it. The photos, or I should say they took very good care of it. The photos all, the, the photos of the knife made me feel like it was a good knife. There was a small, and you'd really have to look at the knife up close in person, a speck of what looked like rust, but I, I was able to, to buff that out. It was just a, a tiny area. But I was able to save quite a bit of money buying it secondhand. Almost, I want to say almost 40% reduction. I mean, the guy even had the original box still. So I don't know if he was a reviewer or if he got it at the gift and just didn't like it. But I was able to save quite a bit of money. So I'm definitely pro-purchasing it. Um, there are some folks on eBay that I have done business with that sell multi-tools, which is another thing that I carry with me on a regular basis. Right. And I purchased one from them, and I made sure that they could, but they accepted refunds because some of the stuff looked a little bit, a little bit extra worn. Now, I like the worn look because it almost gives it a rustic feel, and it looks like, you know, someone's put it through its faces, and it's, you know, taken a licking and kept on ticking, right? Right. Um, almost like generational wear, which is something that I like to pass on, you know, to my son and or to my daughters and, and their children. You know, oh man, grandpa, look, grandpa used this knife. Look, it's got, you know, nicks and 
and wears and right. you know, it doesn't look new but it still works really good you know just kind of that that antique heirloomish vibe to it and so anyways I purchased a few items from this company and one of them came and I opened up the multi-tool and it was just you know in horrible shape and I knew it wasn't going to be in the greatest shape and I was thinking of doing it as a project kind of cleaning it out long story short one of one or two of the tools were broken and I was able to return it and they had no issues returning it and um, giving me my money back so I just tossed it back in the mail and sent it back to them and I had my funds uh, within two or three days so my only caveat to ordering second hand is you know really ask a lot of questions if the photos look sketchy and do your best to deal with people who are willing to take a return you know right um, I I know you use every knife that you purchase is it goes in your regular rotation and you don't just save it for you know just for looks or just to bring out yeah, the, not a, the the term is a safe queen safe queen is exactly. that fit inside of a safe and and look pretty so uh, I don't I don't really do that. So, um, with, with that being said, I do have a confession to make. A couple of years ago, I bought a couple of knives from Walmart. They were priced at $1. Oh, now, my goodness. Now, those same knives, actually it was a knife that, that I brought with me last time you and I met up. Now, those knives are $2 at Walmart. So, when I bought it, part of the reason why I bought it, because I felt like, you know, the price was not going to be a dollar forever. And then, you know, the inventory is not going to be indefinite. So, as as I'm just getting into this, you know, this hobby, this field, this market, um, what's the the appreciation value? How do, how do knives appreciate in value over time? Okay. And so what knife makers do, and unfortunately so, because some of the designs that they've discontinued are fantastic, but you know over time you they feel like they're going to put out a new product or what have you, and they discontinue something. And if you have one that was a real popular design by a company that was discontinued, or a, a line that they discontinued when the company's still going strong, those tend to be a little bit more in value for resale. Um, but for something like that, you, you may need to have it in almost a pristine condition for someone to come along and say, oh yeah, that's worth 20 bucks or 40 bucks more than it was selling for originally, you know? Okay. Um, sometimes... So there's a, there's a company that I order from, well, two companies that I order from regularly. Uh, Blade HQ okay. is a fantastic place to find knives. They are on YouTube. They have fantastic videos. I really enjoy the Knife Banter series. There's uh, two guys there that, that go back and forth about knives, and it's a really great, it's very it's comical. Um, the guy's name is one of the guys' names is Ben, and the other one is Austin. It, they're just outstanding guys, and so I, I enjoy watching them and, and purchasing knives from them. They have a great deals on on knives, and Cutlery Shop is another one that is a, a great place to go for good deals on knives. And what they end up getting from manufacturers are exclusive knives for that store, okay. and so. For example, there's a knife that was discontinued. I don't know if it's discontinued. I know it's definitely hard to, to come by because Kershaw wasn't making as many, and it's called the Kershaw Skyline. Okay. And I really enjoy the knife. I think it's probably one of the best EDC knives I've ever seen, and I, it was hard for me to get my hands on one. And so luckily I was able to come across one, and 
and this one is a limited edition run that Kershaw did specifically for Blade HQ. Blade HQ. So that one, I'm sure, will be worth some money down the road if I wanted to resell it. But again, like I said, I don't really keep my knives in uh, as you know as optional or as optical pieces where it's just like, oh, hey guys, come over here and let's Google at my knives. You know, I always carry it. But this thing is pretty legit, man. It's got a jade colored G10 handle. So the material is, is kind of grippy, but it's a jade color. And the blade is satin. So mm. it's, it's really, really nice. I'll show it to you next time we get together. Uh, I'm definitely a fan of it. I'm going to start carrying it here uh, in the next two weeks uh, as my EDC blade because it's it's small enough for, you know, I can use it and not, you know, scare anybody. Okay. But something like that would hold a, hold a resale because they're limited edition. Well, I'm, I'm definitely going to keep that in mind. Um, it, as funny as this sounds, too, uh, this is a, another confession, I am buying every Walmart brand knife that I can find under 10 bucks right now. <laughs> And and, and and the funny thing is, there's a lot of reviews on YouTube about these, you know, inexpensive knives. And you go to different Walmarts, and not everybody, not all Walmarts carry the same, you know, inventory. And so, in my mind, I'm going to I'm gonna add these to my rotation. But in my mind, I'm thinking, these are not going to last. They're not going to be, these models are not going to be here forever. So, I'm going to get every one, you know, every style that I can come across because... They may not be selling these same th ones next year. Yeah, I mean, if you can get them for a, a you know really low price and find yourself in a position to resell them down the road, certainly. I know that sometimes they go on clearance and and you can get some of their knives for for pretty cheap. But <clears throat> take a look at the quality. You may find it better to instead of buying a handful of knives for, for 10 bucks, taking those, you know, five knives, instead of purchasing five knives, take that 50 bucks and get a quality Kershaw or a SOG, something along those lines. The, the difference in quality is leaps and bounds between the stuff that Walmart puts out versus uh, Kershaw and SOG, and they're, they're pretty reasonable, both of those brands. Yeah, um, I'm I'm still trying to wrap my 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 brain around that spending fifty bucks on a knife. I'm not there yet, and everything that you just said, I've heard it in a YouTube video. You know, saving your money instead of buying five now, just buy one really good one. So um, I, I will I will eventually get there, but right now I'm having a hard time wrapping my brain around that concept. Well, if you're, you know, what I would suggest. To get if you if you're willing to roll the dice and do an experiment, you know what? You should do this experiment and see if if your mind is swayed. Uh, I'll bring a selection of knives with me next time we meet, and you can you know grab one or two of them. Okay. And you know they're going to be um, a little bit more a different quality, I should say, than the Walmart knife that you're used to carrying mm -hmm. and you tell me if you think that they're worth the difference in price oh I yeah and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it. I, 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 I believe that the quality is there you know right now you know I don't even I don't even carry my knives like on a daily basis so you know a lot of times on the weekend when I'm outside or in the garage, you know, milling around, you know, I, I carry, I carry my blade, you know, um, you know, when I'm doing stuff and, you know, the garage and in the, in the yard and, you know, when if I go camping, I'm definitely carrying a blade or two. Um, but, you know, I'm getting into it. So, you know, I think eventually my, my appetite is going to increase a little bit for, for higher quality knives. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get there. Yeah, yeah, but um, um, 
I don't know. Just like it's just like anything else. The, the thrill of the hunt for me, as well as, is getting the most that I can at the lowest cost. So, you know, if I got to cut cut a, a couple more coupons and and you know sell a couple more <clears throat> sell a couple more cans, recycle, you know, do what I can to you know to save up the money and and you know find find some deals here and there. That's kind of the thrill. <laughs> thrill of the hunt for me as well but uh nonetheless i got a couple more questions for you um do you do you customize any of your knives or engrave you know what no i don't um i i don't have the tools to do any kind of engraving there is a knife that I am interested in purchasing that and that one is the Recon by Cold Steel is the manufacturer and that one has a really aggressive handle like the material is a really aggressive G10 I think mm-hmm. um, material and people's number one complaint with it is the texture is so rough that when they clip it into their pocket, it tears up their jeans because it's so aggressive. And so what a lot of people do is they take the clip off and they'll either sand that area down or they'll use JD Weld and you know kind of create a, a mod where they can JD Weld over the area that's going to be touching against the pocket when it's clipped in. Okay. And so that's something that I'll probably be doing once I purchase that knife, just because I don't want to tear up my pants. But I've seen some people, they uh, take, uh, what's it, Duracoat or some kind of a adhesive coloring that you know, can stand up to use, and they'll color the blade, or they'll change the color of the handle and kind of make a, a unique custom look to it. I know on Nothing Fancy's website that he has, his son, Tactical Doodle, does a lot of customization to knives, and they look really nice. But again, I don't have a workshop where I can take stuff apart and or, or the machinery to paint and design these knives. I don't have that kind of background. So I really just like the way the knife looks anyways. But I would enjoy being able to etch something in there just so that I could, you know, either put a name on there or number them or something so that as I pass it on down to, you know, my kid, kid, kids, it will uh, it will have some kind of a sentimental value. No doubt about that. I'm 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 definitely interested in painting knives. What what kind of paint would you use? I'm not not so much the blade, but just the handle. I think you definitely want to use an acrylic paint or maybe I know a big style of paint is uh, called Duracoat it's almost like a powder coat for for the environments of like you know firearms and knives okay and, or Seracote Seracote is another one okay. that they use so uh, you could probably Seracote the handle but um, that's something we could look into it'd be cool to make a little video of Yeah, because the the most popular knife at Walmart right now is this tan flipper, and I just don't like the color. That tan color, it just don't, it does not resonate with me. And so, I, mean, I could go green, I could go gold, I could go silver, you know, camo, whatever. I could go anything, but that tan, it just doesn't work for me. So, um, I'm looking to, you know, try to paint one at some point in time. Okay, yeah, definitely coordinate that, and um, I'll be willing to uh, to work with you on that. All right, so um, I got one more question, and then we're going to be close to our mark for this episode. Um, 
How do you feel about swords and fencing? Does that fall into your knife, um, you know, fascination or knife collection? I don't. I don't have a draw to swords other than I think they look cool. Okay. Um, the design of swords that I think I'm probably most drawn to would have an Asian flair to them. While I do appreciate the, the broad sword, those huge swords that you see in movies where like Vikings are carrying them and right. uh, you know, like the uh, Crusaders have these huge blades. Right. I think they're cool to look at. I think the, the detail in a lot of them are, is fantastic. I don't see myself owning one. I mean, I'm, if someone was to give it to me as a gift or if I was to, you know, maybe fall in love with a design, but right now it's not on my on my list of things that I want or, or aspire to have. And if I did, I, I almost think I'd go with the, with like an Asian type sword, a katana or a, or a samurai sword. I think those look very elegant. Um, and and that's kind of appealing to me. But I I really like stuff that I can use, and I don't see myself pulling out a broadsword or a katana or a samurai sword during you know uh, you know a party to cut up some ribs or something. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> uh, that'd be kind of that'd be kind of over the top. Like hold on. Let's Woman, fetch me my cow. <laughs> uh, so I, it, but I, I think they're they're fantastic, and there's a lot of people who, who do collect them, and there's a whole market for that. And if you're looking for resale value, those are going to be probably the route to go because there's a lot of folks that are really into that stuff, especially your your Renaissance people who really enjoy that era. They'll pay top dollar for an authentic blade. Okay. And, and you know, something just yeah. tri- triggered my mind now. When you're talking about how, you know, it'd be better just to save up your money and buy, you know, uh, a better quality knife. Um, next time we, we, we talk, I'm I'm more interested right now to see what, what could I trade for a knife. Doesn't have to be knife for knife, but what else could I trade? Could I trade... Maybe some photography services or whatever. I'm, I'm interested in that. As opposed to me part with my money, what can I part with as another product or a service? You know, you could post, there's a couple of Craigslist style websites right. that are geared towards your, you know, firearms and knife and outdoors kind of community and they're always open for some form of trade I don't know I mean you can always ask them what you know let them know what you have to offer and see if they're open to it but there's definitely room for that you could probably even negotiate something on eBay I mean reach out to the seller hey instead of 50 bucks I got uh, I got these casino gold cigars here yeah, you know. <laughs> got a whole box of them. But yeah, I mean, you could definitely look into uh, into doing that. I'll send over those links to you, and uh, and you can see if there's anybody open to trading anything, or even post on there. Okay. You know, hey, I I got photography lessons or equipment or whatever, <laughs> and I'm looking for this style of a knife. Let me know if you're open for a trade or something. You know, you never know. This is true. You never know. You never know. Uh, so I do have one last question. It just came to me. And um, it's a little bit of a sensitive question. And if you don't want to answer it, I perfectly understand. But you have military experience. You were in the Army, correct? Yes. So um, if you have a knife that was used in combat, is that something that you is that a knife that's separate from your other knives like would you pass that one down to your 
to your kids or your grandkids or is that actually just separate and you know those knives are kind of off limits to your you know your your legacy you know um that's a good question i don't have any that were used in combat but i um so it, it'd be hard i mean it would depend on I, I guess on the individual for me personally i think and i get very having to use one in combat but if if i did i think i would want to pass that on okay um uh, yeah, I think I, um, I think it would carry carry with it a you know a story, right? You know something something that can be shared along with the knife. So yeah, I think I think I would want to pass it on. But again, I mean, uh, I think it would be that would be like a one off response, right? I think everybody. I I think if you ask ten people, you may even get ten different responses on on how they would feel about that. But me, I think I would pass it on. Okay. Well, I definitely respect that um, that position. So, um, you know, you have definitely educated and enlightened me uh, this evening. And so my, um, um, I don't want to sound corny, but my knife bug is uh, is jittering. My, my, my craving for knife knowledge is, is uh, on overdrive right now. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I definitely want to appreciate you for for sharing your expertise in this area with me and also the Poetic Wax Show listeners. So, um, yeah, you know, you can find us on Mixcloud and Facebook, and uh, we just started posting on YouTube. So I'm pretty proud of us for that. Yeah, no doubt. So, um, I, you know, I, I showed you one of the box openings that I did, and um, I'm definitely generating traffic from that video. And I got like two or three other videos that I haven't even posted from uh, other box openings. So I got to get busy on that. So I want to share that with our viewers and our listeners. That's kind of cool to say. We got viewers and listeners. Um, so um, we're, we're developing traction. Yeah, we're we are. Now. Yeah. Yep. Most definitely, but uh, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna be quiet. I'm gonna let you uh, close out any closing comments or remarks or shout outs. Sure, closing comments. Always be searching for more knowledge. Hmm. I think uh, I think knowledge is power, and a closed mouth doesn't get fed. So ask, ask, ask. Those are my my parting thoughts for this week. Those are wonderful words of wisdom, and I'm definitely going to uh, take heed and apply that thought. So this has been another episode of the uh, Poetic Wax Show. We're going to continue to bring you guys great content. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for viewing, and peace out. Peace out, y'all.